page 14. Sunday school now. The rest of us will chant next. Second chant, When I Awake. There are several verses, so you may want to look on page 26.
next few minutes to meditate, <coughs> sitting up straight, opening our heart, calling out to the Divine Mother, in that point between the eyebrows, Mother, awake me in thy light, doing it with great fervor, and then resting in our heart, waiting for her answer, feeling that divine presence. In the next couple of minutes, let's do this in silence. Now remaining inwardly focused, taking these words, Swami Kriyananda from the book Affirmations for Self-Healing. The spiritual quality this week is joy. True joy is not an emotional state. It is not that which one feels when some desire is satisfied or when everything at last goes well. It is inward. It is of the soul. It can be developed first by not reacting emotionally to outward things. Don't be tossed on alternating waves of success and failure. Don't join in their excitement, the buyers and sellers in the marketplace of this world. Be calm in yourself, even-minded and cheerful through the gains and losses of life. Then in deep, calm meditation, feel the joy of the soul. Hold on to that joy through all activities. Don't confine it, but try ever to expand it into your little joy becomes the joy of God. The affirmation we'll do together, first loudly, and then more and more softly until we do it mentally. I am even-minded and cheerful at all times. I am even-minded and cheerful at all times. I know that joy is not outside me. I know that joy is not outside me. But within. But within. I am even-minded and cheerful at all times. I am even-minded and cheerful at all times. I know that joy is not outside me. I know that joy is not outside me. But within. But within. I am even-minded and cheerful at all times. I know that joy is not outside me, but within. The whisper, I am even-minded and cheerful at all times. I know that joy is not outside me. Now 
mentally, taking it deep within. I am even-minded and cheerful at all times. I know that joy is not outside me, but within. And pray mentally with me now in the calmness of meditation, at the heart of my inner peace. Help me to feel thy thrilling, joyful presence. Om. Peace. Amen. Now we'll have our reading for this morning. Today's reading is from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentary on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by J. Donald Walters. Intuition is simple, the intellect is complex. Truth is one and eternal, realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10, we read a passage that Yogananda often quoted. And they brought little children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. It has often been noted that a critical attitude tends to paralyze creativity. Good critics, for example, seldom produce works of creative genius, though their creations may be intellectually clever. The intellect separates, it analyzes, then puts things together again piece by piece. Intellect lacks intuition's flow, which descends smoothly like a river from the superconscious. Paramahansa Yogananda described intuition as the soul's power of knowing God. To receive the kingdom of God, Jesus was saying, one must do so with the openness and trust of a little child. Intellectuals may object to this statement, saying, but there must also be discrimination. You wouldn't want a person to be so open-minded that his brains fall out. The truth is, however, that the intellect can be fooled, even when it does its best to discriminate wisely. Only intuition is capable of penetrating to the heart of a matter and knowing truth from falsehood. It was the clear understanding of a child, not the elaborately persuaded intellect of his elders, that enabled the child in Hans Christian Andersen's story to cry out in surprise, why isn't the emperor wearing any clothes? Therefore it was that Sri Krishna said in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. To you who are free from the carping spirit, I shall now reveal wisdom sublime. Grasping it with your mind and perceiving it by intuitive realization, you shall escape the evils of delusion. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh, oh, oh. Good morning. I don't really need to say anything with this <laughs> altar. This, this expresses so much of what this topic is about. The beauty, the flow, the devas who have tended to these vegetables and fruits, 
the farmers who have intuitively tuned in to those devas and done what they wish. I think to get the whole topic up here, I need to add perhaps a stack of weighty books. <laughs> Kant, Schopenhauer, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe throw in a little Swedenborg, which couldn't be understood at all. Anyway, um, this is a very important uh, topic this morning because it shows us the direction in which we want to go. And it, it's not throwing out one for the other. It's acknowledging the part they play with one another. You know, when Swami Kriyananda, the founder of Ananda, uh, met his guru for the first time, Yogananda asked him, did you like my autobiography? And Swami said, oh, yes, sir, and a few other things which he regretted. Like he mentioned a split infinitive, and uh-oh. <laughs> that intellect was just jumping up and getting him. Um, but Master said, that's because I put my vibration in it. And that's what we feel when we read it. So intuition is not just airy-fairy. Now, Master did say in something I was reading yesterday that the world, the intuitive world, is full of, of unseen beings. It's a world of many unseen forces ready to help us and aid us and do our bidding when we have desires that will take us in the right direction. You know, Swamiji may well have completely understood, and I bet he did, that statement that Master made to him about you love the book, you respond to the book because I put my vibrations into it. Because when he was a student and a very intellectual student, he wrote a thesis on Homer and he had the chutzpah to say in that thesis that there was a lot of light in the book. And of course, his professor would have none of it. And so he didn't get a very good grade. But that's, a, again, an intuitive breakthrough in the midst of um, reasonable understanding. Master says, Yogananda says, that intuition is a proof of the existence of God. It helps us to see that there is so much going on that we cannot comprehend with our minds. There is so much aid around us that if we would only open and let it in, we would be truly guided and can be truly guided in all the different moments of our lives because there is nothing that God, Divine Mother, wants more than us to grow spiritually and to come out of this darkness. When I awake, I'll see thy face. That's what she wants, and she's a messenger of intuition. Our intellect would have us ignore that whole reality. It's kind of hard to, hard to hold on to, hard to put between the covers of a book, hard to put between you know, the two sides of our brain. But the two can work together. We can understand that to respond to an intuitive hunch may mean that we need to check things out with others, see if it sounds like the right thing to do, in order to respond to something that speaks from within. Perhaps we take the first little step and see if that's the right direction to go. So as I said, we're not letting go of the intellect. Master also mentioned that we should learn through our intuition to feel what it feels like to be another person, to reach out and try to understand 
by tuning in. Try to understand the reality of others. That's a very interesting statement, and it, it's, it would be an interesting one to take with you as you read different stories, say, in the Bible. You know the famous one where Christ says, if someone would slap you, well, then turn the other cheek. That's about feeling for others. Master said, if you get angry, if life gives you a slap, and you get angry, you completely shut the door on intuition. You completely shut the door on the gift that's being given in that experience of persecution, say. If you can just stand there and offer the other cheek, you say, I understand. You're annoyed at me, and you want to give me a big punch. It's all right. I've been there, too. I know what that's like, because we, we are all one another. We have all been in the different places that each of you may be in this morning. It's all right. It's a bit messy. It's very messy. And, uh, and we just try to do our best. Master also says that anyone that we have ever loved is a path to God. And once again, it's referring to that other than intellectual way of moving in the world. The love that we have for each other will make us recognize how large the world really is, how much we are capable of expanding and moving beyond our little concerns. How great the potential is for us to know what we need to know. We really, really have this ability <coughs> of intuition. Everyone has it. And it tunes us in to the truth. It tunes us in to what Divine Mother is trying to say to us. And it's the only thing that we really want to know. Books and ideas and all of that are lots of fun. And in fact, one way to keep your intuition constantly moving is to think creatively. We need to think creatively and do creative things. The two, the two will work off of each other. I have a friend at Ananda Village, Krishna Das, and he told one day two very interesting stories. He worked with Swami Kriyananda in the early years, probably Crystal Clarity wasn't around yet, although I haven't checked this out with Padma, because I don't know exactly the dates, but it was probably Swami special projects kind of things that Krishna Das was working on. And he said there were two times when he was with Swamiji where he saw this creative thinking in action. And they were just ordinary times. One was standing in line at a grocery store. They were buying food. And Swami looked down and noticed that by the counter, there were these little books. And he said, wouldn't it be nice if we could have our little books on a counter such as this? And that was the beginning of the secrets of happiness and the secrets of um, inner joy and secrets for children and secrets for men and secrets for women. He just took it, just followed it right through. Wouldn't, wouldn't this be nice? Always thinking creatively, always thinking and building on that intuitive understanding of loving and serving others and recognizing that we all need help on this journey. And so another time, Krishnadas said Swami Kriyananda came up to Seattle when Seattle was just a little house full of people who wanted to get something going. And Krishnadas was one of the people who wanted to get something going up here for others. And Swami sat at the breakfast table, and on the breakfast table was a little calendar with Bible quotes on it. And, you know, Krishna said, of course, Swamiji just could have chatted with me or told me what he'd like for breakfast or, you know, whatever. 
But there he was, and these, these Bible quotes were little cards, and there he was rearranging them. He put them in a certain order, and then he saw him change this one up here, this one here, this one here. He's thinking creatively. How might I put these together to get a certain flow again and to send out into the world to help others? Such sweet stories. And then we know also of the other, the other side of it, the time when Sri Yukteswar would, he would sit through probably a lot of this kind of thing where pundits would come and try to convince him of some deep truth of the Upanishads or Mahabharata or some other dusty tome. No, the Mahabharata isn't a dusty tome. But anyway, um, try to convince him of some complicated truth. And so this pundit came and was expounding. And um, Yukteswar made no response. And the guy was, I knew it. The guy was probably thinking, I knew it. These guys are just a sham. He knows nothing. I'll keep going and show him what I've learned. And he went on and on. And Yukteswar sat there. And then finally, more minutes went by, and Yukteswar said, well, you've come for a visit, but I haven't heard you. I haven't heard you say anything about your own experience. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh, there it was. There it was. There's the catch. And the guy was evolved enough to say, I don't, you know, sort of shamefacedly, I don't have any experience of realization. And there it was. He didn't argue with him. He didn't challenge him. He just asked him on the level which was important for him to wake up on. And he could admit he wasn't there. So, you know, it's, as I say, it's all a matter of balance. I remember in my life as a child, I was a crybaby for a good number of years. <laughs> hmm. And my mother would say, dry those tears and use your head. Good advice. Good advice for a crybaby girl, I thought. Someone else's grandfather used to say, use your head for something besides a hat rack. <laughs> Guess whose grandfather that was, Anantas, his Irish grandfather. <laughs> You know, I've been reflecting on India because we're getting ready to do uh, an Indian international dinner. Um, what's the date in October? Ooh. June 5th. OK. Anyway, and um, the art group is going to work along with the international dinner committee, and we're thinking India. And it made me reflect on my trip there in 2004. That's getting way back there now. Um, but it doesn't go back there, actually. It comes right front and center when you call it to mind. And what I remember so vividly is the feeling of the presence of the mother there, everywhere we went. That culture has lived with God consciousness for thousands of years, and it's palpable. This isn't just something that's, yes, invisible to our biological eyes, but not at all invisible to our spiritual eyes. But it's real and powerful, and it can move us and instruct us and bring us the solace, that God consciousness. And in India, it's everywhere, and I've maybe said this before, but when I went on that pilgrimage, I had witnessed a lot of pilgrimages before that going and, and heard about the culture shock and all that you needed to do to get ready. And so I was doing some inner work on that. But after the first day, I turned to Asha, who was leading the trip, and I said, I do not understand how you have been able to come here and lead a trip eight years in a row. 
And she said to me, I see what you see. I step in what you step in. I smell what you smell. I hear what you hear. But every time my foot hits the soil of India, I feel so much joy, I would come back a hundred times. And I know that. And I said to her, <laughs> this was the first day, and I, we, we had 33 days to go. I said, I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> and I felt when we left that I would come back in a second. I would come back any time. I still feel that way. It's extraordinary that there is a place on this earth that can carry that for us and give that to us. It's just extraordinary. So, you know, it, I, this subject is so vast, and I've just sort of touched on it a little bit. It's always about, it's not an either or question, you notice. The topic just states it. And it's about right relationship of the intellect and intuition. It's about clear reason and calm feeling. It's about going in the direction we're going in our meditation and our desire for God and coming into the world of intuition. It's a wonderful definition of Ananda. It's a place of intuitional living. Divine Mother, she has a plan. She has a plan for every day and every moment. I just had a week which demonstrated that so clearly. I have a friend that I've been wanting to see, just, you know, to see, to be with. And I have been not well and haven't been able to go to S Spiritual Renewal Week in the village where I would see her every year. And this year, she decided and I decided, this is, this is not right. We're going to do it. And out of my mouth popped this phrase in my email saying, what are you doing in September? I have no idea where that came from. No idea where that came from. And she said, I'm coming to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'd filled up September. I had said to Riemann, please don't schedule classes in September. Again, it was like, hmm, someone's giving me that advice. And so. September filled up with appointments at group health. So I had an appointment when this friend could come. I don't care. I'll get, jump in the car and I'll go with you. OK, that's what we'll do. But I'll be half asleep for half the visit. This is not good. So group health calls and said, we're bumping you out of that. We're bumping you to the end of the next week. There were two days. And I said to her, have you ever been to Kameno? Have you ever been to the farm? We'd both love to. Let's do it. That's what we did. It was just, and every email that we sent back and forth with each other said, Divine Mother's plan, Divine Mother's plan. It was glorious. It was wonderful. I highly recommend it. Just rely on her. She has far better plans than you do. And then you don't have to get into the carping spirit about group health. What are they doing just bumping me out and bumping me this and bumping? <laughs> She's doing it. She's setting it up just perfect. So um, she is gracious. She is good. She does the best for us. How blessed we are. When we awake, we'll see her face. From Whispers from Eternity, by Paramahansa Yogananda. Infinite Spirit, thy presence is hidden equally behind the warm rays of the sun and the cool light of the moon. Those lights, though welcome and wonderful, reveal only Mother Nature's splendor in matter. They reveal not thee. To me, they are therefore darkness. Thy all-revealing, majestic, and supreme light shines not on, but from within, the center of everything, therefore creating no shadows. Shadows in this world reduce light itself to non-light. In theory, I have known this. Now, Lord, take all darkness away from me. 
wherever I sit with eyes shut, enclosed my own darkness, caused to blaze upon me in glory the aurora of intuition that suffused in this light, I may gaze raptly on thee with worshiping eyes. We have an opportunity to make an offering. Please take what you'd like to give and hold it in your right hand and pray with me. Divine Mother, Divine Mother, we offer thee the fruit of our labors. We offer thee the fruit of our labors. Bless this offering. Bless this offering. That it serve as a channel of thy light. That it serve as a channel of thy light. To truth seekers everywhere. To truth seekers everywhere. Om. Om. Peace. Peace. Amen. Amen.
to get one of these sheets too on your way out. I'm just going to highlight a couple things. First of all, healing prayers will happen to, today after the Sunday service. We'll have a little bit of time for snacks and then Christy will ring the bell or chime. There's Christy back there. <coughs> and if you have folks in your life that need healing, it's wonderful to come together as a group and feel the power uh, of the healing prayers that Yogananda gave us. So do join in with that. And we have some wonderful classes, some new classes that are coming up in October. Tuesdays in October, October 7th through 28th, is Jamana and Lynn Warshower teaming up to teach Finding Happiness. So it's four Tuesday nights. You can sign up downstairs. And also on Wednesdays in October, Naiswami Navritti and Suryadas are going to come together. And in case you don't know, Suryadas is Joel. <laughs> got a new spiritual name. So he'll be helping uh, Navritti teach a class called the Eightfold Path to Superconsciousness. And that's four Wednesdays, October 8th through 29th, right here in Bakel. So there's more, so get a bulletin. <clears throat> to the Festival of Light, written by Swami Kriyananda. Let us lift up our hearts in a festival of light. The essence of this ceremony has been passed down from ancient times. O waves that we are on the bosom of the infinite sea, joyfully let us celebrate our own greater reality. For now, by God's grace, our redemption is at hand. The promise has been given. The divine light returning anew to earth has given us power, as the Holy Bible proclaims, to become the sons of God. Into our hands have been delivered the sacred keys of awakening. Abundant now is our hope. The Lord through the Bhagavad Gita promised, even the worst of sinners by steadfast meditation on me speedily comes to me. Again in that holy scripture he declared, even a little practice of this inward religion will free one from dire fears and colossal sufferings. And whereas suffering and sorrow in the past were the coin of man's redemption, for us now the payment has been exchanged for calm acceptance and joy. Thus may we understand that pain is the fruit of self-love, whereas joy is the fruit of love for God. From sun and moon and all the stars, from glistening seas, high mountains, desert solitudes, and vast fruitful plains, and from the hearts of mankind and of creatures everywhere goes up in wordless yearning a prayer for redemption. Please stand and repeat after me. <laughs> Almighty source of all that is. Almighty source of all that is. From sorrow lead us to everlasting joy. From sorrow lead us to everlasting joy. From darkness lead us to infinite light. From darkness lead us to infinite light. From death lead us to immortality. From death lead us to immortality. Oh. Fledgling bird once flew out into the world, gained strength and wisdom, its parents told it, and what you acquire, share with others, even as we have shared with you, for you are a part of all that is. Thus, Lord, we left you countless eons ago. Ours was a holy mission. You charged us to learn great lessons from life, to be fruitful in the gifts you had given us, to expand and multiply them. Alas, we abandon our mission. Instead, we hoard it selfishly. Nor did wisdom come to us when repeatedly we lost everything we had. For the young bird in flight for the first time gloried in its newfound strength. It began to think, how foolish I would be to share my strength with anyone. What else is wisdom, if not to keep what is mine for myself? And so we, like that bird, entered upon the second stage of the soul's long journey away from its home in God, the stage which is called the revolt. That bird's brief day was like eons of our time. When afternoon came, it entered a storm cloud and soon found itself struggling for its life. 
Wind and rain lashed at its wings. The more it fought back, the weaker it became. Give yourself into my hands, cried the wind. To your strength, I can then add my own. At last, the little bird heeded this counsel. Then suddenly it found itself soaring joyously high above the clouds. Hours passed and night fell. The little bird grew afraid. How, it cried, can I fly in this darkness? And the night whispered, fear not, for lo, peace awaits you in the unknown. Surrender to me and your strength will be renewed. And after a time, the tiny rebels surrendered and found the night's counsel true. And rain and sky and grassy fields all sang, Behold, your very strength to fly has never been your own. Look to the source of all power, if you would conquer fear and weakness. And the bird asked, Where can I find that source? And they answered, Seek it in the farthest steps of being, in your own self. Thus gradually the bird entered that third stage of the journey which is called the quest. We now, like that little bird, have come to realize that buffeting winds are life's way of giving us strength and courage, that even fear, like shadows on a statue, gives light and substance to hope. From the depths of unknowing, Lord, we cry out to thee, is there no lasting purpose to our lives? Behold, all that we thought was light was but darkness. Who are we in reality? For what end were we made? Ever and again, through your awakened sons, the answer comes. The forming of stars and moons and planets, of galaxies revolving on the tides of space, of drifting continents, upheaving mountains, snowy wastes and dark, silent ocean deeps, had but this for its design, the birth of life, and with life's birth, the dawn of self-awareness, passage through dim corridors, a waking consciousness to emerge at last into infinite light, into perfect joy. O oh, children of light, forsake the darkness. Please stand. Know that forever you and he are one. Raise your hands and chanting old. Ask that the power of God replenish you in body, mind, and soul. Oh.
<laughs> Gaze upon this light as a symbol of God's love. A prayer of love went up from earth and you responded. A ray of your light flashed out from the heart of infinity, burst downward through night skies of consciousness, and was born on earth for the redemption of mankind in human form. Many times has that light descended, drawn to earth by the call of aspiring love. Your chosen people have always been those of every race and nation who with deep love chose thee. Please pray with me, O Lord, o Lord with, all heart, with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my, mind, with all my, soul, with all my soul, and with all my strength. I choose thy love. I choose thy love. I choose only thee. I choose only thee. The infinite Christ consciousness, the only begotten has come down anew to earth for the salvation of mankind. When we need you, Lord, our beloved, you descend by proud indifference unaffected. Excuse me. Our human griefs your love alone can mend. By proud indifference unaffected, though eternally rejected, you remain our friend. Lord, we filled with divine love, Jesus appeared to the great master, Babaji. The lights on the high altar of my church, he said, have been growing dim. Though still lit on lower altars of good works, the noble taper of inner communion with the Lord burns low and is ill attended. Let us together, united in Christ's love, set lights ablaze on that high altar once again. Thus a new ray of light was sent to earth through the great masters of this path. Greater can no love be than this, from a life of infinite joy and freedom in God, willingly to embrace limitation, pain, and death for the salvation of mankind. Such ever has been the sacrifice of the great masters for the world. Here then is the fourth and last stage of the soul's long journey through time and space the redemption. Lord, we offer up the little light that is in us into thy blazing light of infinity. Grant us the grace to know thee and make us ever increasingly pure channels of thy love to all. Please stand. Thy light within us shining as a shore. celebrate the grace of God that has come anew to earth through our line of gurus, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Sri Yateshwar, and Paramahansa Yogananda. This grace is eternally channeled to mankind by great masters in every religion. 
It has been given new clothing by our gurus to reflect man's dawning awareness that matter is only a manifestation of divine energy. In God, all are equal, not only Jesus Christ, Lord Krishna, and the great saints everywhere, but even in essence, those on earth who have sinned most greatly. Joyfully lifting up our hearts in song, we pray that we who earnestly seek communion with your light receive it in our lives abundantly. who feel so inclined to come up to the altar and receive the touch of light from the masters. As you approach, offer a prayer of gratitude to the infinite Christ in whose love our line of masters have descended that we might all come to God. Pray too for the grace to share with all as you have received for you are a part of all that is. May the light of Christ, the infinite consciousness, shine upon you. Om Christ, Amen. Om Christ, Amen.
stand and send out to all the world the blessings we have received. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Father, Divine Mother, Divine Mother, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Friend, Friend, Beloved God, God, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Lahiri Mahashaya, Sri Yateshwar, Sri Yateshwar, Beloved Master, Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Saints of all religions. We humbly come to thee. We humbly come to thee. O Divine Mother. O Divine Mother. Help us to be like the little child. Help us to be like the little child. Open and trusting. Open and trusting. And help us to surrender our little egoic selves. And help us to surrender our little egoic selves. Into thy great self into thy great self that we might live more and more that we might live more and more from our intuitive sense from our intuitive sense we thank you for our blessings we thank you for our blessings peace peace amen amen go out with joy 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 ever new 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 joy joy friends. Thanks for coming today. If you're new to Ananda and would like more information, you can talk to Doc Sheena just outside these doors. And please join us downstairs for some snacks. And also, um, you can see there's a lot of abundance right now, and there's a lot more abundance downstairs that you can enjoy. Uh, We have tons and tons of wonderful fruit, and we have tons and tons more coming in, so please come and get some. (laughs) So we have space in our truck to get more. So thank you. (laughs) 